Hi, this is Gloria, your mindfulness coach, and welcome to another episode of Life Say Shuffle. Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your mindfulness coach and NLP practitioner, and welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Today is Saturday, and we have a great special guest um, on the other side of the world. I, it's a place I'm going to visit one day. It's a place I have to visit because it's so much wonderful cultures there at this place. She's all the way from the UK. Her name is Tiffany Charters, and Tiffany, welcome to Life's a Shuffle. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me here, Ron and Gloria. I can't wait to share my story with your audience. Uh, you don't have to wait. You can start oh, sharing I it now. Go. I'm ready to listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiffany, and I live in London in the UK. I have two children, a little girl um, who is five and a little boy who is six. And yes, I had them a year apart, and that's crazy. Some people, in fact, not some people, everybody tells me I was crazy, but um, I had kids late, so um, I just wanted to get it out of the way. So that's that's why they are so close in age. Um, but yeah, so a little bit of my backstory. I was not born in the UK. I was actually born in Zimbabwe, but... Um, Zimbabwe went through like a really terrible time because they had um, civil unrest and, you know, they wanted to get independence um, from the British. And that, that, that was around the time just not long after I was born so that my mum decided to, to leave Zimbabwe um, for me because she just didn't want to bring me up in that environment. And, she, you know, she had no idea what was going to happen. So we first went to um, live in Geneva, Switzerland, and we stayed there for three years. And then um, my mum uh, met my now stepdad, um, who lived here in the London, in London, UK. And then we moved here. So and so I grew up here from the age of six. Um, so I did all my schooling here, everything, and um, we did move to one more place, sort of. When I was about 11 but we only stayed there for a year so I've kind of you know kind of been all over the place so we emigrated to Australia and we lived there for about a year so from 11 till 12 but uh, the hot like we as a family my sister was two so she can't remember and but we hated it <laughs> we absolutely hated it and it just because the place that we lived in in Australia which Brisbane uh, um, at the time it was just so different to to London, like London is so liberal, so cosmopolitan, so forward thinking. And we were like in this small town just outside the big town of Brisbane. And it was really, really different. So it was it was hard, a hard change for us. So we decided to come back. Um, and then my parents uh, stayed with me in England for a few more years. And then, then they just, they, you know, so they had this bug of like moving around. So then they moved back to Zimbabwe when I was age 17. And um, I decided to stay behind. You know, I was in college and I was like, you know, my friends are here. Everyone's here. I'm not going back to live in Zimbabwe. I don't even know anyone in Zimbabwe. But they had been gone for like a year and I missed them so much. And um, my mum was having another baby, uh, my brother. So uh, just a quick story on, on uh, my siblings. So my mum had me um, from my dad and then she met my stepdad and then she had my sister when I was nine years old. And then um, when she was nine and I was 18, she had my brother. So we are all nine years apart. And like we always say to her, oh, oh wow. my gosh, like, mum, how did you like work this out that you were having a baby every nine years? <laughs> But anyway, so I, I had missed them so much. And then I had this little brother on the way. So I decided to move to Zimbabwe for a while. And um, it was when I was in Zimbabwe, and I was there for a couple of years, that I met um, my ex-husband. Um, so he was also Zimbabwean. And um, we got into a relationship. And then, uh, and then there was more unrest again in Zimbabwe when they started um, taking over the farms and I was like you know what it's you know it's not looking good here we, we thought it was going to be another war zone again so we decided to move back to England and then we got married here and it was when we moved back here um, that my husband um, 
became really, really abusive and he was physically abusive and he didn't do it while we were in Zimbabwe because, you know, his parents were there, my parents were there. And so nothing ever happened while we were there. But when we got back here, I was all alone and he had basically had me all to himself. He sort of cut me off from all my friends and um, and my family and he was, you know, very controlling. I couldn't go out. He, he told me what I could wear. Um, he controlled like the money and um, and he was physically abusive. So whenever I did anything wrong that he didn't like, um, you know, I basically used to get hit. And um, that went on for a number of years until one of my family phoned my mom and told her that, you know, what was going on. And um, my mom, you know, kept speaking to me. She, I, she did come over at some point, but of course, um, anyone that's in a relationship and you've got other people telling you that you should leave that relationship, it's either you're going to be too scared or you, you, because you really love that person, you, you're not going to want to leave. So in this case, it was both of those things. I was absolutely petrified of what he would do to me if I ever left. Um, but also on the other side of that, I really, really loved him. I loved him so much and I kept making excuses for him and, you know, I would lie about what he was doing and I was hiding it from my family and I was saying, you know, it's not that bad. And sometimes I'll say, oh, you know what, he just had too much to drink and all these kind of things. But it got to the point where it was so bad and I was so unhappy and so stressed with it all that I became really ill. And I actually landed up in hospital because of stress. And in the middle of summer, I mean, it was boiling hot here. I caught pneumonia. I don't even know how. But I think because I was so stressed, my body was, the, my immune system was being attacked because of, because of the stress that I was under. So I just caught a bug. And I, for some reason, I don't know why the doctors couldn't, you know, work out that it was pneumonia or they just didn't test for it. I don't know what they thought. But I landed up in hospital with pneumonia, double pneumonia and, you know, it was quite serious. And it was only at that point then my mum flew back again and she, you know, once I became conscious, because it was a part of the time that I wasn't conscious, so I guess when they were treat, treating me, that I, um, she said to me, you have to leave because you're going to die, you know. If he doesn't kill you, something else is going to kill you, like the stress or whatever it is. And, um, you know, and luckily, you know, she was able to stay with me at that point and give me the strength and the courage to be brave, to walk away from him. And you know what? The, the funny thing was is that all, all during this time in, in my career, I was so successful. I was earning so much money, but I was so miserable and I was just hiding everything. But I, I had more power than I realized. I didn't realize that, you know, it didn't occur to me. The house we're living in, I bought for it. I bought it and paid for it. Um, the car that I had, I bought it and paid for it, you know. But in my mind, it was, it was, it was ours. So I didn't have any power to leave. And it took my mum coming to say, look, this is your house. You can ask him to leave, like legally, not in... in in another way, but legally, you could say, I need you to leave. You know, I don't want to be with you anymore. But I did not feel that I had that power to do that, even though. So I was powerless, not knowing that I had the power, not feeling like I had the power, but I did. And it took someone else talking to me and saying, this is what you need to do. And like, do this, do this, do that. In fact, my mum took him to the side because not only was he being abusive, but at this point when I was in hospital and I didn't know this, he had been cheating with another woman for a year and he had hid that from me. Oh and, my God. And I found out <laughs> just before, um, just before I went into hospital, I had found out that he was with this girl. But of course, you, you know, someone who's a cheat will always lie about it. Oh, it's not serious. I didn't mean it. It doesn't mean anything. I don't want to be with her. I want to be with you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But, um, I think it had got to the point where it was just a bit too much. And um, my mum was like, you, you know, if you're going to want me and the rest of the family in your life, you, you're going to have to choose. And, you know, you are able to do this and you are strong enough. And she encouraged me. And like I said, she was there for two years. 
no, sorry, three months. Um, and she, in that time, once I came out of hospital, she was there and she had spoken to him when I was in hospital and said, look, you need to leave. You, you know, do you love my daughter? Because everything you're doing, you're cheating, you're beating her up and all of these things. And so why are you here? You know, what are you doing with her? If you don't want her, then just let her go. And, um, and at first he, he, he said to my mum, well, I just don't love her. And he'd never, ever said that to me. And so when my mum told me that was such a hard pill to swallow, you know, to, to you'd been rejected so much. You'd been cheated on. You'd been, you'd been physically abused and all of these things. And then they say, well, I don't love you. So now not only do you have such low self-esteem and low confidence, you actually feel so unworthy. So, I, you know, like if I was at rock bottom at this point thinking, why doesn't he love me? Like, what have I done? What's wrong with me? You know, all those kind of things that go through your head. But really, there was nothing wrong with me, you know, and it was him. It was, you know, he had chosen to do some things that weren't right for whatever the reason and maybe we weren't compatible or whatever it was. Um, and, yeah, so he did leave. Um, so my mum had the word with him, but when, when I came out of hospital, I said to him, you know, you have to go because I can't, I can't be in this toxic relationship anymore. So I'll give you a month to like sort of find somewhere to go. Um, and he, he did, he, he and this girl, they found a place to live and, um, and, and he left and I saw him maybe once or twice after that. And then I never saw him again because I just said to him, I never want to see you again. Um, I don't, you know, want you anywhere near me. I was too hurt. I was too broken and I really needed to heal. And it was kind of around about that time that I had, um, I'm going to say I found faith, but I already was, I, I never grew up in a household where my parents were believers. So it was, it was never something that was taught to me, but because I was going through such a hard time, I had this innate thing in me like to go to church and to to find God and to really be rescued you know because I was completely broken and um and I would say that that was the best place for me to go and be in that time because when my mum had to go back to Zimbabwe I was left again I, I did have um cousins and my sister was here but my sister's really young and you know that people are living their lives aren't they they you know they get on with their lives and so they might be around a lot for the beginning but it kind of that wears off and so I was kind of I was all alone and so I I found God and I went to church and then I decided to rent out my house and I moved um with some of the girls that I met in church we we got flat together and that's really where my healing process started really where I started to to rebuild myself to to find my value again to find my confidence um and to find a new family you know that loved me unconditionally and accepted me and you know and also feeling that love and acceptance you know unconditionally from God and it it was amazing and I, I met the most amazing people who you know were so had such a huge part of you know my healing journey and building me up again to the person I wouldn't say that I am now because obviously I went through a seven-year process a seven-year time of being single before I met the next person but by the time that seven years was over I was I, I was a whole person again I wasn't so broken and and um I'd healed from what um that my ex had done to me and um I'd forgiven him I'd forgiven the girl I'd you know let go of it all and I was living my life and and um that's where I changed my career and I I, I studied coaching and I did so much I did I did so much work on myself you know spiritually um in my mind in my body and everything and I and I had these amazing people around me and um and then I met the second guy um, and we never married. Um, so I was only married to the first guy 
and sort of in the middle of that seven years we'd, we'd got a divorce because at first he, he wouldn't do the divorce but eventually it went through um and then yeah so when I met the other guy I was back to being who I was you know that person I was whole again I was happy I was confident and everything and when I first met this guy um he was the most loving, attentive, charming. Um, I don't know what's all the, the wonderful words you can say, you know, seemed seemed like a very put together. <laughs> He's a knight in shiny armor, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 did, he seemed you like very charming. Like uh, after what I had been through, I was like, oh, my goodness, is, what is this? This is the person I've been waiting for all my life, you know. And, you know, I felt confident enough to at this point because I'd been alone and single for seven years and and I'd done a lot of work on myself to think that I I could um pick the right person and know the right person and the thing is is that um I didn't have a clue and and for all the people out there that if they meet someone like this you there is no way you will ever have a clue who they are, what they are, because they are so amazing at hiding who they are. Um, a lot of um, people liken it to they have a mask up and that mask never slips. It does slip occasionally and you might get sort of glimpses of who they are, but because you're so in love and they're so wonderful and, you know, they treat you that certain way for quite some time that you you would just put it down to, you'd make an excuse about it. And... Um, it, it, this one was like a real whirlwind because three months after we met, I fell pregnant. Um, and that was a little bit of a hard conversation because it was very early on. And it was a, sh a big shock to me as it was to him because when I was with my husband, I never, we, we did try for children. It just never happened. And now I'm, you know, I'm at my mid thirties. I, I just thought maybe, you know, children wasn't going to be for me. And so it happened. And then, the first, I guess, red flag that I chose, I'm going to say I chose not to notice, was that he tried to force me to have an abortion. And he was like, if you want to stay with me, then you have to get rid of the child. And I said, well, it's my body, it's my child, wow. and I am not going to get rid of it. And he was like, yes, you are. I'm going to take you to the clinic now. And it was almost like a passive aggressive um, encounter where he was telling me to have this abortion, trying to force me to have this abortion. And it wasn't aggressive or shouty or anything like that. And it was like, well, you need to do this because, you know, this is not what I want. So I said, okay, if it's not what you want, that's fine. But I'm not going to have an abortion. Um, and I don't believe in it and I don't want it. And it's my body and you don't ever have to be involved. I'll never ask you for a penny. I have my own home. I have, you know, I've got a good career. I don't need anything. So if you want to go, you can go. And he did. He was really upset with me. He he didn't, he, um, he just couldn't believe that I didn't do what I was told. And he did go off. He went off for two months and I never heard from him. Oh, my God. And the way we left it wasn't like, okay, we're broken up, it's finished and, you know. And then, and then he, he got back in contact with me and, um, oh, oh, yeah, there was actually one other thing that happened before I found out I was pregnant, actually. And at the time I didn't think anything of it, but it will come up um, a bit later on in the story. Um, but he went on holiday without telling me and but he just in the end he kind of he just went missing he said I've got to go something's happening at work so I'm just going to take a break and I'm going to go and um so I just I said okay I took it so that that was a, a, another little red flag but I kind of just believed what he said and so anyway so after I told him I was pregnant I didn't hear from him for two months and then he came back and he says okay well how will um I accept that we're, we're going to have this child and um uh oh you know we can move in together you know and i i had a house so i said okay we'll move into to my house 
And, you know, so we've got home, we've got, you know, he just doesn't have to do anything, like everything is set up for him. And um, so it was, so then it was kind of okay again. It was that, that nice person came back. And then my mum came on holiday and uh, she met him and she never told me this, but only later on she told me, but she, when we, when she was here on holiday, um, she, we took her out for dinner so she could meet him and all this kind of thing. And then when we were driving home, I put my hand to hold his hand and he pulled his hand away. And my mum thought that that was really weird. She said, I, you know, and she just said from there, she kind of got this cold feeling of him towards me. And so from that moment, and you know how um, mums can be, once they take a dislike in or they have this intuition, yeah, it's yeah. really hard to change that, change her you know, mum's mind after that. And literally, she it's just never liked him. From that, that point on, she yeah. never liked him. But anyway, we everything seemed to be okay. And I, I was oblivious. I, you know, was full of hormones and so happy and having a baby and so happy that I was going to be a parent. That, you know, all the little things, and there were probably more, and I used to just ignore it because, you know, I, I had this baby come in and I was so excited and, you know, we were moving in together. And it was once we moved in together, the the cracks started to show. Now, this is nearly sort of one year in. And um, so we didn't live together until we'd, we'd been together, I guess, a year. So we he moved in, we'd been together a year and I was just about to give birth. But he was still, you know, living in his his place. And then and it was once he moved in that certain things started to show, like the the little bit of controlling behavior, um the you know, kind of saying you you can't you can't do this and you can't do that, you can't see people. And then if I did if I went somewhere and didn't tell him, then he wouldn't talk to me for a week and all these kinds of you know that's a a big trait of theirs is to do the ignoring as a punishment and his punishment was a, a lot of he used to that was one of his favorite ones was the the punishment and then the withholding of love so um so he would ignore me for a while so not actually talk to me at all he's living in my home um but i you know again i was opened it up and said like this is our home i'm not going to make it like that and then um yeah, and then and then after him not talking to me for a week or two, then but then then I'd get more punishment as and then he wouldn't he wouldn't hug me, he, he wouldn't kiss me, he wouldn't, you know, he would give me no affection. And of course I'm so starved of emotion. I'm a new mum and and I'm craving his um his love and attention and approval and all these kind of things. And then I would try to change myself and do everything that I can to make him happy. And I, I tell you what, I would do the most minuscule of things that a, a normal person wouldn't even care about. They they wouldn't even worry about that at all. But it's an it's a way, it's another way of them breaking you down and trying to control you and um I guess just getting you to conform to to their way. And um and you know, it just slowly got worse and worse. And then, you know, then the financial stuff started to come. And, um, you know, like withholding money because and then so after I had my first child, three months later, I was pregnant again. So I couldn't go back to work. Um, and uh, so I was pregnant. And then when my son was a year old, then I had my daughter. So and then I had another year off work. And that's when so at the t- when, I, when we got together, I was working as a coach, but for a company, a corporate com- company. And, you know, because I got pregnant one after the other, it was it was impossible to go back to work and, you know, to pay for two lots of daycare for the children. It just sort of didn't made no sense. <clears throat> so now he's controlling me financially because he's the person bringing in the money in and I'm not bringing any money in. And it's another form of control. So I've got I've got this, you know, the ignoring, the withholding of emotion, the financial control telling me what I can and can't do here and there, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's all very passive aggressive and almost done with a smile on their face. So you kind of just think, is he really doing that? Or, 
you know, am I like, is he actually just doing something and I, I don't know what's going on? And this was exactly what was going on. And But I just was so caught up with pregnancy and children and, and all sorts that I just didn't see it coming and it was get, getting worse and worse and worse. And then the biggest mistake I made was when my daughter was two, my son was three, was I sold my house to buy a property with him. And um, at this point, the the abuse oh, used to come. It wasn't all the time. It used. It would. You see, the thing is, this kind of abuse comes incrementally, and they do it so almost like you can't really notice what's happening to you. And um, and of course, once we'd sold the, my house, now this was now my last bit of independence gone because I wasn't working and I this was my last thing that belonged to me. So now the car belonged to him. And when we bought the the, ha- the house together, the other house, um, he was like, you're not working. Um, you're a stay-at-home mum. So only my name can go on the deeds because you, you shouldn't be allowed. Oh. And I I I just I just kind of went with it like stupidly like I was so stupid, but I did one clever thing. I did really one cle- clever thing because I um, I protected my money that I put into that property with a solicitor. I got it, a legal document drawn up, but not knowing that even with that, even with that protection, my money is protected. Um, the fight to get that money back, which I'm still in, which we'll go into shortly, um, is oh, it's it's crazy he knew exactly what he was doing by not letting me put my name on the on the property and it was almost as if the plan was to to steal that money and it, it kind of you know he kind of did some messy things and that kind of came out um but yeah so now we get into this place that his name is on the door i've put the money in to buy it he had no money at all um so he didn't put a penny in and then now the abuse gets worse, so much worse. It's like he he was going out all the time, not coming home, sometimes wouldn't come home for days on end. Um, now I was finding out about other women and and now he's not hiding it because he doesn't care. He's got me in this position where I am so dependent on him <clears throat> All my money is tied up in a property that my name is not on. Even though my money is protected at what we call land registry here, um, there's really nothing I can do without a court battle to get this money back. So I'm stuck in this place. I'm miserable. I have two really small children and he does whatever he wants and says, well, you met me. I was like this and you better just you better just take it. I'm not going to change I can do what I want, um, and you, you, you can't basically. So I mean, and and in the process of this, my family obviously are seeing what's happening to me, and they are, you know, he's pushing them away. He doesn't want them around, and he starts to alienate me from my family. And so I'm not seeing my sister. He drove a wedge between my sister and I. And, um, and, you know, stop me from seeing my friends. Um, and my mum used to have to come and see me in secret, you know, like when he was at work. And then like Christmases and stuff like that, he would tell people to leave our home. It's like, get out of my house. It's my house. It's not her house. She can't tell you to stay. And it, it oh, just wow. became like a nightmare. I, I, I just couldn't believe that I was living this life again, where I was in a nightmare, I was so miserable, I had two kids and all my power, so I thought, is gone again. And I was like, how am I in this position? I'm turning 40 and my life is in ruins again, so I thought. And um, again, the, my, my saviour, that I mean, he even stopped me going to church. So by this point, I'm not going to church anymore. I, I mean, he he just like just tore down every part of my life. He tore down like my belief system. He, you know, did things to me to make me think I was crazy. He was putting me down all the time, making me feel worthless, um, isolating me from everyone that can 
you know, support me and encourage me into, you know, doing the right thing. And, and that was really to leave him. And now the power has changed because before it was my home, my, all my things, and now everything is in his name, the car, the everything. And he was like, well, if you leave, you get out, you're going to go, you're going to leave this house. And he put the kids and I on the street. When I said to him, I don't want to be with you anymore, he put the kids and I on the street. And I say that on the street. We had to go and sleep on the floor in my mom's house on a mattress. And I had no money. He had, like, stripped me of everything. And so now I'm back to – and this is two years ago now. Um, So now I'm back to – Basically left you guys homeless. Yeah, he made he made us homeless, and I went to court to try and get the the um, the house back. And um, the judge, who was a woman, and I couldn't I couldn't believe this, said to me, um, and he he said to the judge, so he said in the court of law, I'm selling that place, and I'm going to give her her money back. So um, she can't stay there. It's my name on everything. And so and the judge listened to him, and he says, I've done nothing to her. And, um, you know, and the judge just believed everything he said. And, you know, up until now, I haven't mentioned it, but like, I'm pretty positive and I can't say this for sure because he's not diagnosed. But when I started reading up on the things that was happening to me, I, the word narcissist started to come up a lot. You know, when I was, I was looking at this, you know, the person ignores you, the person makes you feel like you're crazy. The person is, you know, controlling you financially and this and that and and then I was reading other things about what narcissists do and it was like I had this checklist in front of me and I was ticking every single box oh my gosh this is what he does oh my gosh this is what he does oh my gosh this is what he does and I'm like oh my god I you know I'm pretty positive I'm living with someone who's got a narcissistic personality disorder he's so cold he has no empathy he has, um, he, you know, he's no, there's no feeling, there's no love, there's no nothing. And um, just right towards the end of our relationship before I, I you know, had to leave with the kids, um, my ex-husband, the one that I was married to, had committed suicide. And um, and this was, oh, I think, man. yeah, he, he killed himself nearly two years ago. And um What I didn't know about him, and it explains a lot about our relationship, was that he had um, a mental health problem. So he had schizophrenia and bipolar. It was undiagnosed when we were together, but when his sister called me to tell me that he had passed away, um, she told me everything. Because when we used to speak before, I always used to say, look, you know, our lives are separate together. We're not anymore. So when we talk, let's just talk. You know, we have a relationship. We don't need to talk about him. So I never knew that he had a mental illness. And it's only after he passed that I found out that he had a mental illness. And um, and I felt terrible. You know, this is a person that I loved. And no matter what he did to me, I would never wish that on anybody's life at all. So it was heartbreaking to know that what he went through led him to his death you know and um and so I've had this phone call I'm sat on the bed I'm like crying and he's he comes in and was like what's wrong with you and so I told him and he says well what do you care like he deserves to die you know oh my you shouldn't care about him and I I was like what kind of a monster are you There's no person on the planet, no matter what they do, that deserves to die like that or in any other way. I mean, it's like me saying the same thing to you. Like, why? I mean, that's just, and that's when I really realized what a monster this person really is. He is devoid of any kind of emotion, any empathy, any anything. And it really opened my eyes as to who he was. And that really gave me the strength to walk out with nothing. I mean, we walked out with a few bags of clothes. And then after that, he changed all the locks. And we couldn't, I mean, because I owned the house before, every piece of furniture that was in that new house we bought belonged to me. 
the kids' beds, the ki- the wardrobes, everything, all the furniture, every single thing belonged to me, and he wouldn't let me have it. So we had to, I had to go to court to get our furniture once we got a new place to live. And so we were without our furniture, without the kids' clothes for five months. This is a man that professes to care about his children but wouldn't give them their beds, wouldn't give them their blankets, their pillows, their clothing, their toys, everything. So, you know, everything of all of my belongings, all my jewellery, everything, everything was there and he wouldn't give it back to us. So it had to us going back to court to get all of that back. And um, it just all of this, you know, was just confirming like who he was. And um, yeah, and we've just recently finished. We, we were in court for a couple of years and with to do with the children and that's just finished. And now the last thing to do is to go to court um, about, for um, is the property so that I can get my money back. And it um, so that's the battle. But yeah, that's the this. I guess I don't know if I've covered everything, but the story of my two um, abusive <clears throat> relationships. You know what? Um, first and foremost, thank you for healing yourself by sharing your story. Yeah, and thank you for giving us my new details. I was in total trance because I I never experienced suicide, um, but I do have two kids. And they're back to back. They're, they're literally one year and one day. No, less than a year apart. Sorry, they're like one year and no, thirty-one days apart. Sorry, one year, one day apart. There we go. I got it. <laughs> and um, they're sixteen and seventeen. I kids at a very young age. Yeah, that's another story in itself. On my podcast, I talked about it before. But what hit me the most is. Um, I'm gonna get, I like getting metaphors and visual ideas. Um, so you know, like a puppet has strings. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are the puppet and the person where a person is a person is, a, is the puppeteer. Yeah. And I was in a relationship on and off for years. And um, it was sort of, I, this part, I don't know if they're, like, yeah, I don't know if they're diagnosed, but they are a narcissist. They will withhold love. They withhold sex. Mm. They withhold time. They'll use any excuse um, to not see me. Uh, then I went and talked to them for a week. Then they called the phone. I'm like, oh, my God, they called me. I'm like, oh, 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 hello, hello. Yeah. I mean, that what was happening. And um, I remember going through that. It was just my emotions were like this constantly. Now, fortunately, we never had kids together because I dated somebody else. Yeah. We never got married. We were not tied financially. But, oh, my God, just – the, the purse strings that pull at your heart because they know you how much you want them. In this case, she knew how much I wanted her. Yeah. And stupid me, I'm like this, right? I, I, I can't see, wait a minute, Ron, you know, there's a lot of women out there. I, I want her. I want her. I want her. The idea that not to have her was so compelling that I wanted her more. So the more she played this, the more I wanted her until one day she had to go back to her country um, to take care of some business. And she says, look, uh, Ron, you have issues, you have problems, and I can do better. Because what she did one time, I'll never forget this. You know, um, at the time I had a Hyundai car, okay, which is not not the best of the car, but I have one's car. She had a BMW. She always tell me, "You're a hot guy. You should get a BMW. You should get a BMW." Okay, so what happened? I would always drive her car every time I went somewhere. And one day we're driving back to my apartment because she had a house, had an apartment, and hang out. And she looks at me and says, "You know what? I can't remember what what caused this conversation to happen." But she says to me, which I'll never forget, is I can do better than you. This, this guy that are millionaires that want me, what, what do you guys offer me? And driving that car, I, I felt as you know, I'm five foot nine, but I felt small as an ant. Mm. And I said, oh, my God, I just t- to now to look back, I would say, OK, cool. These guys that want you, they're millionaires. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, tell you what, let's just end this. You go and have them. And be done and be done with me. Yeah. But but she knew then these are, are the things she could control me with. Yeah. And I just never forget. And now here comes the idea. I gotta start giving her more. So I mean I gotta start spending my own expensive purses, spending my own expensive shoes. I gotta start doing wine and dying to prove this person I'm worthy because I never thought I was worthy. So I didn't know that until I did my own work that I wasn't worthy 
of anything. So wherever someone threw at me, I thought I was only worthy of that instead of pushing it back saying, no, I'm not. So hearing your story about the, um, your narcissist or your, like I said, baby's daddy or whatever you want to kind of say it is, um, it's really compelling to my story, even though we weren't entwined financially and mm. we had no kids together. So, it's, but it's, whew, boy, now, now it all makes sense why she's <laughs> so hot and every guy she meets, she's only good for six months to a year relationship. And then she always says, Oh, why, why, why is, you're so hot? You have everything together. Oh, you know what? It's, 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 not, it's them. It's not me. No, it's, it's it's you. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not realized the reason why every guy sees her, sees this and says, I'm out of here. I, yeah. I can't take this anymore. Then she does this. Every now and then she'll send a text or like, uh, what was it, seven months ago, I get a text at the blue. Hey, you know what? Did I leave any paperwork at your house? I'm like, we haven't dated in like five years. I don't even live in that apartment. I don't live in the same state anymore. So you're thinking I'll keep some, but it was a, a uh, Lord put it out there to say, okay, see if he responds. Yeah, see they they want to see if they can reel you back in. That is mm-hmm. part of their game. They try to reel you back in, and 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 then the cycle starts again. So they'll so the beginning part is that the love bombing, which is what they do to you to make you fall in love. They're this charming, gorgeous, seems so well put together person, and then something happens and then they take it all away and then you become this like love sick puppy i need i need that love i need that attention and it's almost like you have taken a drug and you're addicted to it and they have you on that they have that push and pull with you that keeps you addicted to and and so craving their love and attention and approval and that is why and like you say that up and down it is an absolute roller coaster and you don't know if you're coming you're going you feel crazy you you feel like what have I done and you've done nothing you've done absolutely nothing that warrants that kind of behavior but to them it's a game you are you're a piece of meat and you know what I heard him my ex the the narcissist the supposed narcissist describe a woman like that she's just a piece of meat and I'll, I'll have a taste whenever I feel like it I was like that's a person you're talking about oh you know that's a person that's somebody's daughter you know this is and I mean you can't even imagine the stuff that he said about me like it's crazy it is absolutely crazy um the stuff that he said and even the judge said to him I can't believe I can't believe that you're saying this, these things. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it was really some bad stuff. And of course, they didn't believe him because they could see what a liar he was. And the unfortunate thing is, is that I just didn't see through him at the beginning. And, and by the time he had reeled me in so much, it was too late. I was already addicted, you know, and I just couldn't get enough. And I was always trying to to get his approval. I was always trying to please him. But the thing is, is that what I came to realize, and I'm sure you have too, is that they date a specific kind of a person. So that millionaire that that girl was talking about wouldn't be the right person for her because she couldn't control him and she couldn't do all this nonsense because they would say, you know, get away. Like, what do you think you're doing? And they need the people like us who are so who are people pleasers, who are empaths, who are, um, you know, who can be molded, who will end up being submissive, you know, can be controlled easily. Um, Because all we do is we, you know, we try to make everyone around us happy. And, you know, like we always put ourselves in those, in their shoes and, and like some other people, they just don't have that. They just, they, they just wouldn't take that, you know, and they see you come in like a big red bus. They know they know exactly who you are, and they picked their victims most of the time exactly in that way. They check that list off. <laughs> yeah, they're they checking the list it. off. They're looking for us. They can feel so, it. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. You went through a lot of stuff. I did. Yeah. Okay, and this question is not uh, attacking you and your story. I, I'm just a extremely curious person, and I, I shouldn't be saying that because. 
I shouldn't use it as a lure, but I am curious. Um, you said something in the very beginning, which I don't know how, how it played in your life, but you said about the confidence and self-worthy. How much does that play a factor in your relationship with these two different individuals? Yeah, I think um, obviously they're, they're attracted to that kind of thing. And, and like I said, what, you know what, with, with my first, with my husband, the first, the first guy, he, when I look back at it now, after I told you he committed suicide, he had mental health problems. When I look at it, like when it started really going downhill was obviously it was the beginning. It was the onset of him, his mental illness coming to him. And it, and it was obviously a really gradual process. So I understand, you know, those outbursts and there was paranoia. And I mean, there was all sorts of things. It was all erratic. It was, it was, you know, when I look back on it now, I understand it. So with him, it's different. You know, he wasn't in his right mind and, you know, abuse is abuse and it's, you know, there's no excuse for it, but some people, like if you read up and um, I'm listening to this book called The Body Keeps Score and it tells you about all the different mental illnesses and, you know, sort of how it affects you and, and how it manifests itself. And people with those kind of mental illnesses, they have those violent outbursts. They can't control themselves and stuff like this. But whereas with a narcissist, because it's a personality disorder and most of the time they really, oh, sorry, we just um, switched out. Um, most of the time okay. they, they, um, they know exactly what they're doing. And with a narcissist, it's a game, you know. They see that you have that, you know, you might have this outer shell that portrays this kind of person. And, yeah, I was confident and I was bubbly and I was outgoing, but I was also, and I guess from the way that, you know, you, you speak to a person, you get to know them, you all kind of get to see that this person is quite a soft and gentle soul, even though they might outwardly look they, you can still be confident and still be a gentle soul. Do you know what do you know what I mean? And you could be confident, but you could be hard as nails as well. Like there's the two different ways. And he could see that in me. He could see that I was that kind of a person. And it this is a game to them. This is not about they love you, they don't love you. It's a game that they play. And the game is that I'm gonna hurt you for my pleasure. And I'm gonna continue doing it as long as you let me do it. And I will do everything and anything in my power to break you down, you know, and they love it. They get off on it. So as much as they're a drug to you, that is also their drug. Their drug, their high is you getting broken. And it's just a game. And they have no feeling. They have no empathy. They have no, he couldn't care less what he did to me. He couldn't care less that the kids and I had no beds, no bedding, no nothing and we were sleeping on a floor he didn't care he didn't even offer to give us our blankets my mum had to buy us blankets I had no money he had taken everything you know and he didn't care and those are his kids I know and you know what the worst thing is wow. he went on to try and get full custody of the kids but again it was just that game I'm going to hurt her. I'm going wow. to destroy her. I'm going to take the kids away from her. He was telling everybody, even the judge, that everyone, I'm going to have those kids back. And I, you know, he didn't say he was going to hurt me to the judge, but that's exactly what he was doing. That is all it's about because he's never cared about the kids. You know, so it's just he unfortunate. Enjoys it. but that's he what enjoys it the control. Again. Yeah. It's a form of control. Yeah. I've got the things and you can't mm -hmm. have it. And that's the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. He's totally so, enjoying it. And I like how um, right now we're seeing two different perspectives here. So like with Tiffany going through it with, with a, a male narcissistic and then Ron with a female. Yeah. So, I mean, for the audience or for our listeners, it's, it's actually it could be anybody. You can't just say it's just a female. No, it could no, also no. be a male. And it, do you know what? So, it can be, um, you know, Gloria, I think you came into one of my clubhouse rooms as well the other day. And we have had people come on the panel who it's been their parent has been the narcissist. And there's been other people like wow. come on to oh, speak really? and ask questions. 
And it's been a co-worker and a boss that's been the narcissist. So the relationship is not always an intimate one. Um, it could be, you know, that yeah. parental or it could be one other lady came on the other day and it was her sister and her brother that was the narcissist. Wow. So it they are everywhere. It is not gender specific. It is not intimate specific. It, that it can be anyone mm-hmm. and that it's just all around you in whatever, you know, whether it's your personal life or your work life or, you know, your close friends, whatever. And it's, um, and I think this is one of the reasons why I do what I do is because the, the information is out there, but it's not widely talked about and not enough people talk about this or realize or even have a clue. I didn't have a clue. I'll be honest with you. I did not know what a narcissist was in my mind. I thought a narcissist was someone who was vain and just, you know, thought, Oh, look, I love myself. And it's just so much deeper than that. It's, and it's only until you get in that space and then you start to Google what is happening to me and then you get all this and it's they do this and they do that and they do this and they do that and you're just like, oh, my goodness, how, you know, like how in the hell did I not know this? How, you know, and the information piece and the education piece is so lacking um, in the legal system. In yeah, I think it's th- these kind of things should be taught in school like so that, they could help people to try and avoid this because it destroys lives. Do you know that you can, and I swear, I think this happened to me, but I had to get therapy, um, was that I think for a time I had PTSD when I came out of that um, relationship with the narcissist, the second relationship, the father of my children, because it was so traumatic. And so, like, if you think about, imagine having all those things happening to you, you're abused for seven years, then you're, you've lost your home, you've lost all your money, you've lost everything, you know. You're, can you imagine the amount of stress that I was under trying to keep myself up for my children and, you know, be that support and encourager? But, yeah, I was so broken on the inside. I was dying inside and it mm-hmm. was so stressful. Yeah. And um, I was having anxiety, panic attacks, all sorts I mean, it was it was like the first year coming out of that relationship. It was it was a bit of hell. And I was like afraid of everything. I was afraid of my own shadow. I was afraid of speaking up. I was afraid of telling people what really happened to me. Um, I was afraid of, you know, what I wanted to do in life. I, I, I felt like giving up on everything. And really, this was worse. This second time around was you had- a hell of a lot worse for me than the first time. He really had you tied down, like totally tied down. And he knew that you would feed into whatever he does to you, whatever he tells you, because from the beginning, you felt like he was the one. He he was your knight in shining armor. He swept you off your feet. So he knew from then that what he was getting into, I have, I have her, I have her all tied down. And so after all that now when you see him and if you get a text from him how do you feel how does it how is this like if you see him face to face when he has the kids for visitations or when you pick up the kids it's still really hard I'll be honest with you and there's still um some anger it's not as bad obviously as it was in the beginning because I'm getting to a place of of healing and you know I do a lot of um, mindfulness work and you know like just really working on myself I've never been as fit as I've in my whole life as I am now like I'm looking after myself so well and um, and I think that's what I needed to focus on and not him the good thing is and the way that I've worked it out with the courts is that pretty much I don't see him and there's no contact so the pick up and drop off is all done at school but in some cases like Oh, with the holidays, it's it's inevitable. But I can go for two months of not seeing him while the kids are at school. So, you know, that it's amazing. And I, I'm so glad that the courts agreed to do it in that way. So I don't have to see him. I don't have to speak to him. I told them I don't ever want to speak to him. Um, and I, I had to, because when I had him, like on emails and all the different ways for, for him to contact me, even social media, 
the abuse carried on because he couldn't do it face to face. It was now coming in other ways. So I had to block him on social media. I had to block him on the telephone. I had to set up the kids with their own devices so that they they could communicate with their dad. And I made sure that the pick up and drop off was done at school. But you know what? It is it is hard. So when when he calls to speak to the kids, I walk out of the room because it is still hard to hear his voice because it makes me angry. And I don't want to feel like that. But two mm-hmm. years is really such a short amount of time. And I know that it'll get to the point where it won't bother me and you know, I just won't care anymore because it's already minimized. So I know I'm on the right path. But um, I can't be around him because it, it's a he, he him being around me or hearing his voice is a trigger for me. And one of the things that you have to mm. to do as a part of your healing journey is to minimize those triggers because it doesn't have a good effect on you. And especially because I was suffering from anxiety and panic attacks, I don't know what that effect has had, you know, inside my body let alone on my mind. So I have to protect myself as well as the kids because it's not good for the kids to see that as well. So I have to think about them. So I try to, I've minimized the contact to virtually nothing now. And um, that's the best way for me and for the kids as well because the the level of conflict was just too much. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, listen to your story about what you had to go through. If I listen to you on the mic, I hear a place, okay, I'm in a better place now. What what work did you have to do? I mean, was it overnight? Was it years? What did you do to get to the place you are now? Um, do you know what? I, I think the work that I did in those seven years um, after my ex-husband really set me up because the bounce back this time round was so quick. And I think mm. it's, uh, I liken it to working uh, uh, and building up muscle. So I'd already done the work. And do you know what? I have to say that I surprised myself that how quickly I bounced back. And I think I came to the realization that my ex husband was the person that I really loved. And I did not feel the same way about um, the father of my children. And to this day, I've not cried. I've never cried about that relationship. I've not cried about anything. I mean, the only thing that makes me, I get angry is that the fact that he's living in a house that I paid for, that's the thing, you know, it's like, why don't you just be done with it? Sell the place and give me the money, give me my money back and let's just cut everything off. But, you know, that's not the, the way they play. They don't, they don't play fair. It's dirty. And that's what kind of pees me off. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sad. I'm, I'm really <laughs> happy. In fact, I'm so happy. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, this is, you know, this is amazing. I, I love it. I love, I love, you know, where I am now. I mean, I live in a beautiful area, um, and I just, I just feel happy. You know, and I, I wouldn't have got here if I didn't go through what I went through. And he thinks he's broken me, but he hasn't. He's made me stronger. He's made me really step into my purpose. I'm doing the work I truly 100% believe that I'm meant to be doing. I wouldn't be doing this work if I hadn't have gone through what I went through. So, you know, the way I look on it is that everything that happens to you is a blessing, even though it might not be at that time. But this was just that what he did to me was, you know, just aided in what, you know, my blessing. It was just a, a blessing in disguise. And, um, I was speaking to someone the other day and she tried to, um, she wanted me to like sum it up. And I I used um, a Bible quote and there's this, I don't know which, (laughs) which uh, book it's from or what verse or anything, but it's the one where where God says, I'm going to give you beauty for your ashes. And that's, you know what, I was in ashes like when this was going on, but like, I really feel like that. I, I had my, I had my time. I went through it and I was in ashes two times. But now I feel like I'm getting the beauty from it. Like, that's how I feel. (laughs) This is why you're you're calling this. Yeah, your second um, (laughs) second rebirth. (laughs) Yeah, this is my second rebirth. It's amazing. (laughs) 
Well, you sound, um, you sound more, um, you sound really happy when you were talking about, um, just getting out of there. Like it just showed, you know, your, your actions, your body language and the way you were speaking about it. So I'm glad that you were able to get out of that and, um, be able to just get back up, you know, and I think it's not only just for yourself, but for your kids and, you know, your, your bravery and courage is just staying strong. I think that um, for the most part, um, your kids are your motivation on all this as well, because they're still so young, but they do see you, they will see you growing up that you are a strong woman, you're a strong mother. And I'm curious with, you know, after this experiences that you've had, do you feel that you have your guard up right now? When it comes to romantically? You mean like meeting other yeah. people or just in general? Um, well, first, of course, you know, I th- I felt like there's going to be that trust issue as well. So let's do romantically for now. And then, yeah, let's okay. talk about both romantically and meeting people. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with romantically first. So actually, I did start trying to date about a year ago because um, I, I kind of felt ready. Mm. And then I realized I wasn't ready. So I went on a few dates. And you know, you know what, COVID hasn't helped anything because it, you, can't, you can't really meet anyone. So here at the moment, um, you can go for a yeah. walk, but the, it's winter here, it's quite cold. And so it's just really not, it's not the... the the best conditions to kind of meet someone to go for a walk in the freezing cold or being rained on. But um, yeah, I still feel I do have my guard up um, and I feel it's probably going to take a hell of a lot of time and honesty on the other person's part. Like they, they're going to have to, I'm going to have a lot of questions to ask. Like I'm going to want to know everything and for some people that might seem intense because they're not going to know what I've been through, but I'm going to want to know, like, how's your family life? Like, do you, do you love your mom? Like, do you, do you know what, what, like everything? I just want to know everything because I want to see if there's any. You have to start coaching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I have to look at that. But the thing is, is that, you know, with both relationships, both of them had come from like a hard upbringing um, my, my ex-husband, he, you know, it, he, his family split up when he was really young and the dad, his dad wasn't around. I don't know that I can say that's a contributing factor to his mental illness, but he, he came from a broken home and that affected him. You know, he had, you know, abandonment issues and things like that, especially with his dad. And then the same, the same thing with this, the second one, the father of my children, but he, not only did he have the same sort of thing, like dad not around and you know that but the household seemed chaotic that he lived in his you know his siblings were not from all had different fathers and and it was just not you know like an upbringing I mean although I wasn't with my father but my stepfather was in my life from a very young age and still is till this day and so it was very stable for the longest time you know so I grew up in a different home life and also it was, you know, there was abuse going on in there. And, they, you know, a lot of the times, like, medical professionals say, and, it, it, you know, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but people who are abused, you know, more times out of 10 will go on to, to become an abuser um, and abuse other people. And it's not necessarily mm-hmm. sexually or, anything, you know, it can be different types of abuse. And I think that that's why when I say that I'm going to want to know your whole history <laughs> is because I feel like there's a pattern there. <laughs> and so I'm just going to want to know, like, how stable is your family? And uh, you know what? It, it sounds yeah. a bit much, like a lot, but um, I think it's going to take me a lot to get involved with someone romantically. Um, but in terms of other people, yeah. like in the workspace and meeting other people, I'm generally very trusting but I think it's more the matters of the heart that I will guard. And especially because I've got children as well. What I've been through and because I've yeah. got children, I've got them to protect as well. So, but yeah, I, you know, as soon as lockdown wow. is over. No, one of our, our, our guests.
I was you, gonna, you go first. Go ahead. I was just going to say, when lockdown is over, I will. I'm going to try and date. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, why not? I, I was going to add into that is uh, we had one of our guests on our podcast, and she says, "Look, I have some relationship issues. When I meet a guy, first thing I ask." Have you ever had a coach? Are you currently seeing a coach? Or have you seen a therapist? If you're not doing one of those, have a nice day. I'm out of here. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that one. That, that, so that way one. you have to get a laundry list. Yeah. Did do you have have you seen a coach? No. <laughs> yeah, you seen a coach right now currently? No. Have you seen a therapist? No. Hey, you know what? It's not gonna work out, dude. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Right? Because you know, I'm a coach. I have a coach and I will continue to have a coach because I have different things. I had to work on myself. Yeah. And by me doing the work with a coach, it did work myself. It makes me a better person to meet better people out there in relationships or just in a workspace or just out there in community because you've done the work. But those that never done the work, no one can say they've had a hundred percent perfect life. Nobody can say that because it's not a hundred percent perfect human being in the world right now. No, so no. With that being said, got to do the work. Yeah, you have to. You have and to be working if, on yourself. Even if we've, yeah, and even if we've done the work, or even if you've worked on yourself, you can't still say we're perfect, right? Um, it's it's just nobody's perfect. No human being is perfect. And, no, I, um, I am and you not know, I'm definitely wanted all. to add to that. Yeah, I, I'm not perfect yeah, at all. No, I, no I have is. flaws. <laughs> I probably have hundreds of flaws as well. But um, <laughs> but yeah, you know what? I think it's it's about the honesty <laughs> piece. It's about you know, like the willingness to change. The the yeah. and you know, like knowing that you you know, because a lot of people will will just come to you and say, "I don't need to do anything. You do. You need to to be the one." and that's not going to work. Oh, yeah. You know, that's not going to work. You need to both have this um, knowing about yourself, about where you fall short of, you know, and your shortcomings and, and try, you know, have the willingness to work on it, you know, and, you know, get support from people around you, like get a therapist, see a coach, like you said, and like you guys, like I, I've been, I, I've been a coach since 2012. I have had so many coaches, you know, and and working with coaches all the time. And you cannot you cannot be the best coach if you are not being coached. You're not coachable. You're not teachable. You're not willing to learn. You're not willing to work on yourself. And they those people need to have those traits as well, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and hundred and ten percent agree. Yeah, it's true. And what sucks about it sometimes too is when you're meeting new people, sometimes their true colors doesn't come out till <laughs> till it's like till later. You know, uh, fortunately, some you'll you'll see it from the very first time you meet them. You can kind of sense that already. But like in your case and in Ron's, you know, those the people that you guys were with um, at that point was it just you guys were drawn into something about them. And maybe at that time you guys, you were looking for something, looking for love. So yeah, it's anything that they can do to you. They will take that. And it's like taking a bait. Right. And so the true, his, his and hers true colors was already coming out. You guys just were blinded by, by something about it. And I do have a friend who's like that. And I think Tiffany, I've shared this with you. And unfortunately she's, she's still in this relationship. But I have talked to a coach about that and, you know, it'll come. She will, she will come later on. You know, it just takes time for some people to really realize it and understand um, what, you know, what situation they're in. But uh, yeah, I, I have experienced that. Like sometimes you don't know the person's true color until later and it could be years till later, you know, that you are already drawn into this and you are already addicted to this person. Yeah. You know, the thing is, so I've, I've met a lady um, on Clubhouse and uh, she was almost 20 years, marriage, kids and everything. And she shares this openly. So I'm not, um, she has a book and she, you know, and she, she, she talks about what she went through. And I mean, like I was only seven years she did 20, like almost 20 years. 
and um i i That's just I, I i commend her i i don't even know what to say but i i commend her in so many ways because i don't know like if i would have survived 20 years you know i mean and what she went through i'm not even all the way through the book what she went through, obviously, when I'm reading this book, it's so much of what was happening to me. It's, you know, like there's so many parts in the book that I feel like it's my story. And I just, um, I don't know how she got through it. But you know what? They have this knack of holding on to you with such a grip. And another thing that they do is they have, on the other way, the other way of them controlling you is, is devaluing you so much that you start to believe it. You know, anything that you do on repeat, you either becomes a habit, but also you believe it in your mind. You know, if it's repeated enough times, like even to a child, if you think about it, if you say something to them, whether it be positive or negative, every single day for a whole year of their life, that is going to, in their mind, that is their reality. And this is exactly what they do to you in this relationship. So not are they charming and and you know really attractive and and they have this knack of reeling you in and then holding you there but they keep you there by making you feel worthless like who are you like who are you going to find when you, you've got two kids now you think you can walk out that door and you can get anyone who's going to want you like look at you you're you're like you're 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 past your sell by date you know you you there's nothing anyone wants from you you're worthless what do you have? You've got nothing now. You don't even yeah, own a car or anything, you know, and, and you it's like, feel this it. is, yeah. yeah. I mean, you actually feel that way. And I did, I did until I snapped out of it. it. But like I said, had I not done that work beforehand and had that seven years of building myself up, I, I could have been in a, a way different position. I was just a bit stronger than he probably gave me credit for. And then I had my mum beside me, in front of me, um, behind me. My mum is she. I, she's like a wrecking ball. Like you just you. She she will come and mess things up. For you like she's she's crazy. She's and she was my strength. <laughs> <laughs> and she just takes no prisoners. And like yeah, when I grow up, I want to be my mum. Like she she's you know. She's the one that got me through this. She's the one that, you know, gave me more strength. She's the one that both times that made me realize who I am, you know, reminded me of my worth and of my value. And she's the one that, you know, lend, lended her strength to me to walk out of the, the door, you know, metaphorically both times. So I think that's the important part. And I think we need to touch on that is, that if you are in this situation, you, you're you going to need a support network. You are going to need people to lean on because it's when you come out of there, you are a broken person and you are not believing in yourself. You, you know, your confidence, your self-esteem, everything is gone and you're going to need those supportive people who are going to encourage you, who are going to remind you who you are. And um, so it's so important to have that strong support network around you whether it be friends family whoever you know and if it's really bad like I'm, I had to like get therapy get counseling um get a coach like I, I I didn't get a coach like for a long period of time specifically on this subject but I did speak to a coach about my problems and like how I could get over them because obviously this is when I had when I, I had to take some time off when all of this was happening because mentally I was not in the right place to be able to give people the, the help that they needed. I needed to get stronger again mentally, physically, spiritually to start coaching again. And I never, like with me, like I have to work in integrity. I have to stand up for my values. And, and I, if I can't give it my all and give it my best, then I, I feel it's best not to do it. And, um, yeah, so I spoke to someone who really helped me to kind of work these things out and get myself back on track. Um, so I think it's important that you have that as well when you're, you know, coming out of this journey or even trying to come out of this journey to, to build your life back up again. Absolutely. 
I, I gotta I, since you went through a lot of a trauma here, and it's good you got the help. For someone that's like, what the hell did I do? They're looking to find an avenue. They may not have the resources. Resources may not, they may not have a car. They may not have a computer. Have a, hopefully listen to us, they do have a computer, but they may not have resources or money at their disposal. What is like a, a simple five to 10 steps, someone that's listening to us going where you're going through that can get help? Well, like I said, I think I've touched on the first one. The the um is to have that support network, really. And I mean, friends and family are, are free. If you don't have um monetary resources, um you can do it that way. Um I know that here in the UK, I don't know for the rest of the world, but I think it's definitely something if you're really struggling mentally, is to go and see your doctor like see your your GP and they could probably refer you on to some services to um to see someone um i you know what it's so hard to say this because all over the world like the way that that works is a bit differently because sometimes here therapy you ha- you have to pay for it but um in other cases especially where there's a domestic abuse involved like they can refer you to someone um to to speak to there's also um I know there's domestic abuse charities all over the world, which you could contact and have somebody that you could speak to. But the thing really is, is, and I know it's so hard because there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of shame about what happened to you, um, that you don't find the courage to be able to talk about it. But one of the best things to do, and which is why in a lot of these cases to do with um you know, even PTSD and stuff like that. I know there are other ways to treat it, but talking therapies are, you know, one of the main ways that they treat it. So being able to talk to someone that you really trust and who's going to encourage you in your journey, who's going to support you um, and, you know, just be a good, you know, a good listener, you know, someone where you can just pour your heart out and they're not going to judge you. You know, they're going to be for you. They're just there for you you know, and just love on you and just help you, you know, in the best possible way that they can. 